the May 2020 TAM customer webinar on application modernization. We are very excited to have two speakers with us today, but before I introduce them, a couple of housekeeping items. Our next TAM customer webinar will be on Thursday, June the 4th, and will cover migrating from NSXV to NSXT using Migration Coordinator, a tool that is built into NSXT. If you have any questions during today's webinar, please use the Q&A feature of Zoom and we will address them during the webinar. This webinar will be recorded and your TAM can make the recording available to you. With that, I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker, Vice President Worldwide Technical Account Management, Alan Barber. Good morning, everybody, um, or good afternoon, wherever you might be. Um, and uh, welcome, as Andy said, to uh, our TAM customer webinar. Um, I really appreciate you attending this. First of all, I'd like to say a big thank you for being a customer of VMware and, uh, and also a special thank you from me for being part of our TAM program. Um, clearly, we're living in uh, interesting times right now with uh, COVID-19 and the, the, the impacts of COVID-19 are of impacting us both, in, both in, our, in our personal lives and also in our business lives. Um, in the TAM program, we recognize this. We recognize some of the challenges our customers are going through. And as a TAM org, we're working really hard to help you uh, through these challenging times. And uh, I wanted you to know that, you know, as a team, we're really focused on three, three areas we're trying to focus on that, uh, to, to kind of assist you. One is um, efficiency. So, you know, we really want to help you get the very best out of your VMware investment. We know a uh, majority of our customers are trying to save money at the moment, um, avoid costs, unnecessary costs, and be super efficient in the way in which they run things. So, you know, we're working hard with our customers to get the very most out of their VMware investments. The other thing we recognize is that, um, you know, we, as, as customers have shifted to work more remote work, um, and they're providing, you know, services to their customers and to their employees, um, yeah, they're looking to make sure that their platforms are resilient, can scale and adapt to that, and, uh, and at the very and utmost, uh, they're, they're super secure as well, uh, right out to the endpoint. So, you know, that's the, the, the second area where we're helping. The other area that we're focused on is, you know, how do we help you adapt to change generally in your business? Um, and some examples of where we've been helping our customers is, uh, a kind of in the end user compute space, we've seen customers shift from you know, working on site to um, the whole workforce working remotely overnight. And it's, it's a big shift for an organization. And so we're, we've been working with our customers and helping, to make, helping them to make some of those big shifts so that they can work remotely, get access to the applications they need in a secure manner. Um, and, uh, you know, with a good user experience for their employees and their customers. The other thing we've been looking at, we've been helping customers with is, you know, the next session, next webinars on NSX, uh, NSX uh, vSphere to team migration. The other area we've been helping our customers with is networking. You know, one of the things that we're seeing is customers want to optimize the way in which they run their networks as they see some of these shifts happening. And uh, equally, the other area in terms of adapting for change, which is where Kit's going to come in and talk to you a lot today about is, you know, the, that fastest path to app modernization. As a company, we want to help you build, run, manage, protect and connect uh, applications. We want to help you to do that quickly. Um, and uh, Kit's going to address that area today um, when he's going to talk about uh, the fact that app modernization. Um, so three things we're trying to do, we're, we're aiming to help you with. One, help to make you more efficient. Two, secure and resilient. And three, helping you to adapt to the changing, uh, changing landscape that we're all seeing right now. Um, as we're helping you with this, one of the other things we want to do is more of these events. Um, so you were, I've literally just come from an event which is being run out of the New York area. Um, we've got this one going on today. Um, you know, we're going to be doing more of these because the other thing we, we recognize is that we want to be bringing you more insights and uh, doing more things to help you uh, during this uh, challenging time. So some of the ways we're trying to add value to you, um, I've taken the liberty of putting my email address in the, um, 
in the background here. Um, I would love to hear from you if there's things that we could do differently uh, to help you through this uh, through this difficult time. There's things we can do to add more value. We'd love to hear from you. Um, I'd love to hear from you personally. Um, or equally, you know, feel free to contact uh, your TAM and uh, you know through your TAM we'll, we'll we'll work out how we can help you best. But uh, enjoy today's event and uh, thank you. And with that, I'll hand back to Andy. Stay safe, everybody, and stay well. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Alan. Appreciate your insights. So for the next presentation, we've got one cool cat. Uh, Kit Colbert is going to be covering uh, how VMware is the fastest path to application modernization. Kit's the chief technology officer of the cloud platform business unit. And we're very excited to have you with us today, Kit. Yeah, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Um, so I think I probably know a bunch of you on the call, um, but uh, if you don't know me, um, my name is Kit Colbert, CTO for our cloud platform business. Been at VMware quite a while, uh, moved around, done different things, um, you know, kind of all across uh, our product landscape. Um, and so, you know, the talk today is really around how do we step back and, and zoom out and, and what's the bigger picture and the broader strategy that VMware is driving around application modernization. And, you know, I actually was thinking I should update this slide because the, the term I usually use when I'm talking with customers is that, is that VMware is the surprisingly fastest path to app modernization. That I think a lot of folks don't really realize all of the great capabilities that we have in our por portfolio. And so thus they're surprised when we <laughs> talk about this sort of stuff. So again, the goal today is <clears throat> to try and give you the bigger picture to understand how all the different things that we're doing fit together to help our customers and yourselves uh, drive toward that uh, app modernization destination. So with that, let's jump right in. <clears throat> so, um, you know, as, as we talk to customers, um, what, what I see is that uh, people aren't lacking uh, for visions and strategies, right? They, they, they have an idea of where they want to go. They know the future state architecture of what they want to do. And uh, the challenge is really, you know, how to get there. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, when you, when you look at these sorts of modern apps and these sorts of future state architectures, the same things come up again and again. They want to get to cloud. They, they want to modernize apps. And by that, I mean really going toward a microservices distributed type of architecture, uh, an architecture that allows them to move very quickly and also to scale up uh, to, to very large degrees to be able to serve a larger number of customers. And then finally, the third part is uh, not just Sorry, my cat's here. He, that's my cat guy. Got a lot of cats in the background. I just have one cat here. She's getting on my table. Apologies about that. Um, you know, not just moving from, you know, how the app, or excuse me, what, what types of apps are being built, but how they're actually being built. And that's the whole DevOps transformation as well. And obviously that's not uh, purely a technical thing, but obviously a process, organizational, cultural change as well. So the question is really, Again, how to get there. I think we all have these ideas in our heads. We, we, we see them, we, we read about them. You know, we see the, you know, Facebooks and Googles of the world doing it. <clears throat> and so I think there is this narrative out there, especially from the public cloud vendors about uh, how to get to this, this future state architecture. <clears throat> and I'll describe it sort of in very overly simplistic terms, but I think it kind of gets the point across. So here's the way I've been thinking about it. <clears throat> if you look at uh, where you are today and where you want to go, you can view that sort of on, on two axes, one of which is time, i.e. how long it takes to get there. <clears throat> and this is sort of a almost uh, you know, exponential chart here um, instead of just uh, linear on the, on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis is effort. <clears throat> and so obviously, um, the cloud near Nirvana is up or right because it takes a lot of time and it's a lot of effort. So the question is how best to get there. <clears throat> and I think when you look at the public clouds, what they're saying is, hey, like it's best is to get this all done at once. Just, you know, go all in, <clears throat> jump fully into the deep end of the pool, make this thing happen. And of course, there are benefits to doing it that way. Um, you can realize value more quickly for that app <clears throat> if you can get there. Um, you know, it kind of forces a lot of the change. It's a good forcing function to try, to try and get the whole orgs like, oh, wow, like we're really serious about this. Um, and so, you know, we, we do see a lot of customers uh, going that route or at least trying to. 
but it also comes with a lot of problems. And so, you know, I've got some of those listed out here on the slide. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, obviously, it's a huge effort. And what we realized is that it also takes customers a long time to do this. Uh, if you've got thousands of applications, this is not something that's going to take a few months or even a year. It's going to take, you know, many, many years uh, to do all those apps. Uh, the other part of it is it's very much like an all or nothing approach. You're either, you know, you're, you're re-architecting the app, um, you're, you're moving to this new DevOps model, and you're either kind of all the way there or you're none of the way there. Because, like, you put all this effort into this new thing, and the new thing is this great, you know, architecture thing, but it doesn't really do anything. It doesn't have any of the features of the old one, the old application yet. And so until you can move everything over there, you're still relying on the old one. And if you fail in some ways or something happens, well, you're still on the old one. You haven't really achieved any incremental value there. Um, there's also, of course, a very steep learning curve because everything, the entire world's different, not just tools and technologies, but also, as I mentioned, from a DevOps perspective, the culture, process, et cetera. And so because of that, we do see a high failure rate, uh, people getting into it <clears throat> and just kind of getting in over their heads. But this is the, um, the story, the, the, the narrative that I think has taken hold. And you know, even in the media, you see this a lot, right? This just seems to be the way to do it, in capital letters, right? <clears throat> so I think when we look at VMware, we, we take a different approach, um, something that's more iterative. And <clears throat> the idea here is how can we take these smaller steps that allow you to capture value quickly, realize value quickly, while also moving the ball forward, and then position you for that next step whenever you're ready. So, you know, one step might be, hey, let's rehost. By rehost, I mean, let's move off of our on-prem infrastructure into the cloud. And so we can do this today uh, because of the fact that we have our uh, STDC architecture, right? You can move from an on-prem vSphere to VMC in the cloud completely seamlessly, no app modification, no tool man uh, cha changes, retooling. Now, of course, you don't get all cloud benefits, not like this app is now magically highly distributed and you know always available, you can serve you know, 10 million users. <clears throat> no, but you do get some cloud benefits. Uh, the ability to dynamically scale the underlying infrastructure, the uh, ability to get that infrastructure delivered to you as a service, to only pay for what you use, uh, to be close to a lot of the higher level services that are running there inside of AWS, let's say. <clears throat> um, so you do get some benefits. Um, but the cool thing is you get some of these benefits for basically no effort, like very, very low effort. And, and that's, I think, really the takeaway. And now, once you're there, you can say, hey, maybe I want to replatform. And that, by that, I mean moving from a VM-based architecture to a container-based architecture, or in this case, maybe Kubernetes. And as we'll talk about what we've done with uh, integrating Kubernetes into vSphere and uh, you know, our broader Tanzu portfolio into VCF. We can do that really, really easily for you with very little app modification efforts there, uh, no retooling. Uh, and again, you're getting some of those container and Kubernetes ecosystem benefits for all of your applications, even the VM-based ones, which is really, really interesting and really powerful. Now, again, the app itself hasn't been heavily modified. Uh, it's not magically distributed, right? Um, but so you're getting, you know, but, but the thing is you can take your entire application fleet forward here, get some of the container benefits, get some of the cloud benefits. And then eventually when you're ready to actually roll up the sleeves, get in there, do some re-architecture, what we call refactoring, uh, you know, rewriting a bunch of the app's code. <clears throat> okay, that's what our Tanzu portfolio is for. And we'll talk about that. And the idea there is, yeah, yes, it's more effort, obviously, because you're getting in and actually changing the application code. You might be moving to more of a, a pure DevOps model now. Um, but the point is that you've already taken some steps along this journey, <clears throat> captured some of that value. And so now that gap of the final step there is much smaller than it is if you're still at the beginning. And so I think in this way, um, we have a, a very different point of view on application modernization within VMware uh, than you know, we see from, from other folks out there, specifically you know, the public cloud vendors. <clears throat> so this is, I think, kind of, the, the big picture on it, right? And another way of looking at this, and the reason that we can do this uh, is because we have a fundamentally different architectural approach uh, to our products and our overall software architecture than the, the public clouds. And the way to think about this <clears throat> is to really look at, you know, from a very high level, each of the public clouds uh, are essentially, you know, vertically integrated silos. 
And now again, you know, take that with a slight grain of salt because obviously it's a very, a very large silo for each of them. Talk about millions of hosts here, but um, but it's true, right? You know, they they have their own data centers, very customized uh, to themselves, and they have their own hardware. Um, you know, probably special versions of like Intel processors because they have so many of them. Intel or ARM or whoever will, you know will make special versions just for them. Um, you know, they have all their own um, internal infrastructure management, uh, infrastructure itself, customized hypervisors. And then on top of that, they have their own customized services as well. A lot of them written in-house. And so very, very specific to each one. And, you know, you generally, once you buy into the, the past service layer, you're essentially getting, getting everything underneath that as well. And so that's kind of, you know, one of these lock-in things, right, that people talk about. Now, I'm not, you know, I don't push the, the lock-in narrative too much because I think it's, it's a very nuanced conversation. The point here is really around choice, not so much lock-in, it's around choice. And, you know, um, the thing that, that VMware offers is, you know, the, the broadest set of choice, really, and optionality, more importantly. And so you, you look at us, and rather than having a vertical architecture, we, we really focus on a horizontal architecture. Uh, you know, we're not a physical hardware company. Um, we dabbled with that a little bit in the VCOD Air days. We realized that wasn't the right way to go. We changed direction, and I think, frankly, we're a lot stronger for it. Uh, we're also not, you know, a database company or a, uh, you know, a streaming service company, like messaging. So, you know, we don't do these high-level services. We really focus on, on core infrastructure. And so I think because of that, we have this opportunity um, and this ability to really support a whole bunch of diversity below us and a whole bunch of diversity on top of us. And we can really be that, that glue in the middle of this kind of you know, hourglass type of architecture. And so I think that gives us a tremendous amount of flexibility and allows us to do what we just showed on that previous slide. Uh, it's because of the, this level of, of flexibility and optionality. <clears throat> and so you know, the, the key benefits here, as we've just been talking about, are really around maximizing choice, delivering the quickest time to value, so really seeing value very quickly, and also doing it in the least disruptive way possible. And, you know, we, I think we've talked through all these points, so I don't need to belabor them. <clears throat> but, you know, the, the key here is really on the lower right-hand side, this term of stepping stones, I think really is an important one. How do you move forward, taking these small steps, uh, realizing value with each step, and then figuring out when does it make sense to take the next step? Um, you know, not all applications need to go to the far upper right hand corner of that previous diagram, the, the cloud native nirvana, right? Uh, most of them probably won't. It's probably not worth the time and effort. A lot of them are just fine somewhere in the middle there. And so we can help you get to that middle ground, realize a lot of value, realize a lot of benefits, but at the same time keep costs and the actual effort involved very low. So that's, you know, the big picture there. And so what we, what we can now do is jump in and, and talk about um, the different ways and some more specificity that we can help. And this is going back to the kind of Gartner, if you will, like the five or six R's, refactor, replatform, we host. And so for each one of these, we'll talk about uh, how VMware's products and solutions can, can fit in. Uh, any questions thus far? Let me just pause there. We have a Q&A box here. Uh, I don't see any questions there yet, but if you guys have any questions, please uh, feel free to type them in. All right, so <clears throat> let's dive into Refactor. So again, with Refactor, what we're talking about here is, you know, actually opening up that app and rewriting parts of it, or the whole thing, you know, changing the architecture, moving more to microservices, uh, distributed type of architecture. <clears throat> and for that one, obviously the focus here is on Tanzu. And so um, this slide's a little bit out of date. I I need to fix a couple of things on here. I'll, I will just do that live if you'll bear with me here. Um, so this should not be pluralized. And this is Tanzu. There we go. All right. <clears throat> Sweet. OK. So now we fix that. So here's the way to think about the Tanzu portfolio. Obviously, all the purple boxes here. Um, if you've heard anything about Tanzu, you know that we categorize this as sort of a, a build, run, and manage type continuum. So on the build side, we have a few different offerings here. Uh, the first is what we call Tanzu App Service, and that's really um, what was the, it is the rebranded Pivotal application service, which was Pivotal Cloud Foundry before that. Uh, so it's still the same thing. Uh, there's a lot of work we're doing there to update it. Uh, to drive better integration with Kubernetes and so forth, uh, but it's still the same Pivotal Cloud Foundry uh, if you are a PCF user. 
Uh, Spring Boot, <clears throat> another uh, great capability for developers. Uh, just really simplifying the developer process, allowing them uh, to, to prototype things on, the, on their laptop and then have a springboard uh, directly into PCF or some other runtime environment. You're seeing something like you know, 80 million downloads of this thing uh, a month, it's, it's pretty crazy. Tons of application catalog is the um, rebranded Bitnami. So it's focused on OSS uh, packaging management and so forth. <clears throat> then we have two new products uh, that we built internally. The first is Tanzu Mission Control, uh, which is really focused on managing across Kubernetes environments. Pardon me. And then finally, Tanzu Kubernetes Grid, which is focused on using cluster API to create and lifecycle manage Kubernetes clusters. So let's um, kind of dive in a little bit here. So this is a, a deeper view of, of all the ones I just mentioned here. <clears throat> and um, Let's see. Oh, yeah. The, actually, the one, other one I didn't cover was uh, Wavefront. So Tanzu observability by Wavefront. So right now we're trying to drive better integration of Wavefront to all these different offerings that, that we just mentioned here. So there's a lot of integration specifically with things like uh, TMC, and uh, we're driving more integration there across the board as well. So this is the overall Tanzu portfolio. <clears throat> so let's dive in. So the first one is Tanzu Mission Control. Uh, now, this is one, again, that's really we're looking at as becoming uh, the new management paradigm uh, for, for the modern application space. So the idea here is that, okay, uh, we see our customers um, really standardizing on Kubernetes, using more and more Kubernetes in their environment, and of course, getting more and more Kubernetes clusters. And these clusters are proliferating. They could be on-prem, they could be in the cloud on AWS, they could be a native service like EKS or AKS or GK, um, uh, GKE, <clears throat> or they could be, um, you know, just a DIY type of cluster on top of AWS. However you slice it, Tanzu Mission Control is really there to provide a bunch of management capabilities uh, across all these different Kubernetes clusters. <clears throat> so you look at things like lifecycle management, identity and access. So uh, how do you manage, you know, who, who has access to all these Kubernetes clusters? How do you centralize that? Is it the Wild West now where developers are randomly going off and creating stuff, or, or can you actually centralize and control that a bit? Security and configuration uh, also goes to compliance and auditing. Um, so, you know, are these all upstream compliant? Have people modified them in some way that doesn't meet your corporate standards? <clears throat> and then finally, data protection as well and backup. So this is leveraging a lot of the open source projects that uh, Heptio, now part of VMware, has built. So things like Valero or Sonoboy for, for compliance um, and taking a lot, a lot of that functionality. And then, of course, you know, along the bottom here, we see a lot of integrations into um, <clears throat> things like, you know, Wavefront uh, for observability and diagnostics, into cloud health, into different sorts of optimization, and then um, into NSX service mesh for various sorts of uh, network connectivity, traffic management, et cetera. So the, the first version of this is out. It is a SaaS offering, so we're gonna be continually, you know, continually updating and evolving it, um, but it's pretty powerful. And, and again, you know, I think our thesis as a company is that um, the new infrastructure interface uh, going forward is going to be Kubernetes. <clears throat> and that, uh, you know, we're even doing this with vSphere, right? Building Kubernetes into vSphere to give it a Kubernetes uh, interface as well. And so as you see Kubernetes becoming the new lingua franca of the infrastructure space, you've got to have uh, a management and control plane for that new interface. And that's exactly what Tanzu Mission Control is. <clears throat> so the application catalog, as I mentioned, was, uh, was you know, Bitnami. Uh, same technology underneath the covers. Um, we have this project we called internally Project Galleon, which is really taking that Bitnami uh, technology and evolving it <clears throat> to better suit the enterprise. And so what, what we've done now is uh, essentially allowing, uh, you know, the IT team or, or whoever it is to look at all the different open source components that their developers may need to bring those into their curated internal catalog and then to specify a bunch of requirements around it. <clears throat> what types of operating systems are allowed? What types of configuration, what sorts of agents must, must be installed in, in these different things? And then they can actually expose that as a service catalog. So it's all built in, allows developers to very easily take advantage of that. They don't need to think about it. They don't need to be focused on, you know, making sure this thing's up to date and fully patched. The developers can be assured that it is because it's all already happened here. 
uh, via tons of application catalog. And so then they can grab those binaries and uh, you know, integrate their CI CD systems or, or what have you, and then go and run them um, out in uh, whatever infrastructure they want. So you can see a wide variety of support here. <clears throat> and that is another good point, by the way, about Tanzu. Uh, Tanzu is very much multi-cloud at its core. So we're not supporting just v VMware environments or vSphere environments, but we're actually supporting all the different types of public clouds uh, or other environments that a customer may want to run in. <clears throat> so Tanzu Kubernetes Grid. Uh, so TKG is, um, really focused on Kubernetes cluster management and looking at how do we manage the life cycle of those Kubernetes clusters, uh, making sure that they're properly configured, uh, up to date, uh, handling, you know, rolling upgrades, all, all the complexity there of managing a Kubernetes cluster is taken advantage of. <clears throat> and as I mentioned before, it uses a Kubernetes standard called Cluster API. Uh, to do the orchestration and configuration there. We ensure that all these clusters are, um, you know, the, the latest and greatest from the open source bits, so upstream compliant is the term. <clears throat> so if you've heard of uh, enterprise PKS, this is really tons of Kubernetes grid is the go forward path for um, PKS. So there's a variety of different uh, TKG offerings. There's TKG, uh, TKG, uh, plus TKG integrated. <laughs> so there's a few different variants there um, that uh, can you know, meet your needs. So great thing if you're looking at how do I manage my Kubernetes clusters across any sort of cloud. It could be a VMware cloud or it could be a public cloud or it could be you know, some edge location where you need to, to run Kubernetes. <clears throat> and while we're doing all this, uh, you know, we are very, very invested in the open source community. So depending on how you count and depending on the day or the month, I guess, we're either number two or number three in terms of uh, contributors back to Kubernetes. Uh, it's uh, Google number one and then us and Red Hat are essentially tied and constantly flipping <laughs> for uh, number two. Um, so you can see that, you know, we're really involved with a lot of the uh, uh, special interest groups, the SIGs, um, as well as, you know, on the steering committee and uh, also on the CNCF as well. So a lot of open source engagement. That's a, you know, a relatively new thing for VMware, but something that we're extremely committed to. And frankly, it's only gonna grow uh, over time. <clears throat> I mentioned Cloud Health before. Um, that it kind of fits into our broader application uh, modernization portfolio in the sense that they're really focused on a couple of things. Uh, they're known for, of course, their cost management and uh, how do you look at your AWS bill and actually figure out what's going on there and, and manage a lot of costs. And, you know, that's just for that reason alone, uh, it totally makes sense for customers to get them. You know, we see customers saving easily 20% of their AWS or public cloud spend uh, when they start using cloud health. But what's really interesting about it is that it can do a lot more than that in the sense that it can really help to evolve your organization as well and how your organization uh, operates. You can, it helps you actually move to more of a DevOps model. And what I mean by that is if you can actually expose a lot of the cost information um, back to the development teams, it actually helps them to uh, optimize that cost. So for instance, we actually use this internally, of course, and uh, we have one of our teams, it was an acquisition uh, of ours that, you know, runs on AWS. And so um, that team, uh, you know, they, they get these cloud health reports every week. Each each team member does, and each you know the each part of the team, each component, I guess you would say, uh, gets a bill uh, from cloud health, so showing what what their costs were. And they notice one week that their costs were like you know 10x as high as they were the previous week. Well, that's weird. They didn't have 10x the users or 10x the volume. So they're like, what what, what happened? And they start looking into, it and they realize actually that someone had checked in a bug the previous week, which basically caused their DynamoDB usage to go up by 10x or whatever. And um, they were able to catch that very, very quickly because of the fact they had that sort of, um, uh, you know, the like detailed reporting that could go to those individual teams. And so that's like a good example of how Cloud Health can really help drive accountability down to the individual teams, help them start thinking about, hey, um, what are my costs and how can I optimize those costs? Okay. So that's kind of the, the refactoring. And again, you see a, a lot of different things that are coming together uh, to support. All right, apologies everyone. We had a hiccup there and uh, lost our Zoom. But thanks for rejoining. Um, so let me just pause. I was about to, basically it was actually 
a good, good, a good cutoff point, I guess, because I was just finished with the replatforming section and was going to pause to see if there's any questions. Um, so any, any questions thus far? Everyone in the audience is very quiet. I haven't seen many or any Q&A yet. This totally makes sense to everyone. People are awake, at least on the West Coast where it's still like eight o'clock. Maybe, maybe people haven't woken up yet. All right, well, we'll keep going then. We'll see if uh, we get any questions. So that was the replatforming side, or excuse me, the, the refactoring side. So now let's talk about replatforming. And replatforming, again, in our parlance here is really, referring to a change of a platform and that by that I mean from VM to container um, very specifically. So, <clears throat> and for that one, we're really looking at what we're doing with what was formerly called Project Pacific or now vSphere 7 with Kubernetes. And, you know, what, what we've done here is really, really powerful. Um, I hope most people are familiar with at least the broad outlines of what we did with Pacific. Uh, but if you're not, uh, the essential idea here is that We've built Kubernetes both into the vCenter or integrated into both the vCenter control plane and ESX itself. And what's that, what that's enabled is for us to actually expose a Kubernetes API from vSphere. And so the really powerful thing about this is now vSphere has two different APIs coming out of it. One API that's our traditional API for you know, vSphere admins, so forth, i.e. the folks on the right in this diagram and then an API for developers or for DevOps types fo type folks. <clears throat> and that's the left-hand side here. And so uh, th this new API, this Kubernetes-based API, uh, basically exposes a, a, a selection of services. And so we call these services the VMware Cloud Foundation services. And so th there's a, a few different ones that we have today, and we'll be adding more and more over time. <clears throat> so uh, there's the Tanzu Kubernetes Grid service, so when TKG is running on top of vSphere 7, we actually have a, a very highly integrated workflow and uh, integration for it. It will, of course, run, TKG runs on, you know, vSphere 6.7, uh, that's fine. Uh, but the, um, the one that wor works with 7 is actually a much, much deeper integration. But we also have some other services. You know, we have all the basic type of stuff like networking, storage, et cetera. Uh, we have one called the vSphere pod service which is really about uh, a, a, a optimized runtime uh, for pods where each pod can get its own VM. If you're familiar with v, vSphere integrated containers that we released you know, two or three years ago, same idea there. Uh, you know, VIC worked with Docker. Obviously, this one works with Kubernetes, the same concept. And finally, we have something we, that we're calling the virtual machine service. Now, this one right now is just in tech preview, but uh, the idea with that one is that you can actually manage VMs via the Kubernetes interface. So this is where it starts getting really, really interesting <clears throat> because what you really have now is that left-hand green Kubernetes API uh, can you know, really manage any sort of application running on top of vSphere, whether it's a container, Kubernetes cluster, Kubernetes pod, or VM itself. And so this is what I talked about before <clears throat> and starting to, to move a lot of the apps to be you know, within the Kubernetes ecosystem without any modification. That's what that VM service enables. So it's really, really powerful. Um, very, very interesting stuff here. You know, you know why you want to do that? Well, uh, you can now, if you manage all of your workloads as Kubernetes objects, um, you can store them all in the same container registry. You can apply the different sorts of uh, container registry capabilities to it, such as uh, image signing, uh, automated CPE scanning, uh, leveraging the different uh, container layering type capabilities. And so like you know, integrating it better into CI/CD. Uh, so th there's a lot of benefits you get, even though the app itself is not modified, those infrastructure and ecosystem benefits are really, really huge. But by and large, you know, the broader thing here is that we are really fundamentally evolving uh, vSphere 7 or vSphere itself. Oops. Um, okay, so let's talk about how this actually works um, for, more, for more from a technical perspective. So this is our picture of vSphere pre 7.0, uh, how it looks like today um, for, for most of you. So obviously, you know, this is a very basic diagram. Each ESX host has a host agent called Hosty. And Hosty's job is to talk with vCenter uh, to, get, to give it information about what's happening, uh, you know, like stats and which VMs are running and, you know, so forth. And vCenter uses that, uh, you know, can talk to Hosty to tell it to, hey, start this VM or, 
you know, do a V-motion or what have you. So, <clears throat> so that's essentially the, the pretty simple architecture. No surprises there. Now, what we've done with vSphere 7 is essentially each ESX host now is also a Kubernetes worker node. And thus each ESX cluster is simultaneously a Kubernetes cluster. <clears throat> so what you'll notice is that each ESX host, in addition to having Hosty, the host agent that talks to vCenter, now has something that we call a spherelet, uh, whose job is to talk to Kubernetes. So the, uh, in Kubernetes, they call it a kubelet, they call it a spherelet, which is kind of our cute name, but it's the same thing. Um, it's running as a user world inside of uh, ESX, <clears throat> just like Hosty, and it, it talks to the Kubernetes master here. And so now essentially we have um, two control planes running on top of this single physical cluster. We've got the, the vCenter control plane running up here and the Kubernetes one running down there. Now, it, you know, any student of computer science knows that, hey, if you have two different control planes managing the same thing, that's usually a bad situation because these two control planes may be making different decisions, maybe like butting heads with each other. Uh, so how do we deal with that type of problem? Well, what, what we've done is actually driven a lot of integration between these two. Um, so a, a user using uh, this API coming to vCenter or using the, the Kubernetes API, they can both provision workloads. They can both be provisioning workloads simultaneously. And so what we've done is uh, actually we, we have Kubernetes reach out to vCenter and specifically to DRS when it's doing scheduling. And so it actually leverages DRS's scheduling decisions. So this way, Kubernetes and, and vCenter aren't fighting. You know, Kubernetes wants it on this node, but DRS wants it over here, and you know, getting into those sorts of skirmishes. And so we've actually integrated them so that they can use the same sort of de decision criteria. <clears throat> Moreover, uh, anything that's provisioned via the Kubernetes interface will absolutely adhere to all the different uh, vSphere resource management type of criteria and guarantees. So you can still have reservations and limits and shares and all these different things. And those are all respected. Um, you know, you can apply, apply storage policies and those are all, so, you know, all the different vSphere goodness we have extended to these Kubernetes based applications running within vSphere. In the end, you know, as we'll show that they, they are just vSphere uh, or, or ESX runtimes, but um, what's important is that the control plane, the ecosystem, the interface is Kubernetes and, and there are a lot of benefits there. So really what we're doing here is bringing together the best of both worlds. Okay, so let's say that this uh, developer, DevOps person is calling the Kubernetes API, wanting to provision some applications. Now, let's say that they're using the vSphere pod type capability. What we're doing here um, when we run a pod is we're actually using a new runtime in ESX that we're calling CRX. So if you're familiar with how things work today, the normal VM, we have something called the VMX. The VMX process is responsible for uh, so the kind of the use level side of the uh, VM process. CRX is, is our new name for an optimized uh, container focused runtime. And so the way the CRX works is that, um, you know, it, it's not a general purpose VM runtime. It doesn't support any OS under the sun, at least not yet. We, we, will, we will do that soon. Um, it also is specifically focused on containers. So, you know, with our traditional VM process, we need to be sure we are 100%, um, you know, replicating physical hardware, even down to processor bugs, right? Like we've got to make sure that our virtualization rep replicates everything, including the bugs of the physical hardware. What we're doing with CRX is different. Um, the actual, you know, physical uh, hardware layer is not quite as important as the kind of upper layers of the stack here. And so, you know, there's, there's a lot of shortcuts we can take. There's a lot of optimizations we can do. We don't actually boot the CRX. There's no BIOS boot. There's no ACPI table initialization. There's none of that sort of stuff. We just literally jump into it. It's almost like a process, but it's still running within that uh, VT, you know, Intel VT hardware level uh, isolation virtualization container. So because of that, we, we can do a lot of optimizations and uh, get a lot of performance benefits out of it. As a matter of fact, um, what we've seen is that if you compare uh, an app running inside a normal VM compared to running in CRX, we get about a 30% performance boost from CRX. As a matter of fact, CRX is so optimized and our ESX scheduler uh, is, is so optimized that for compute bound workloads, running in CRX is actually about 8% faster or up to 8% faster than running on bare metal, on bare metal Linux. 
And again, a lot of that goes down to actually the fact that our CPU scheduler is very, very good around NUMA scheduling uh, and can, and can uh, you know, just <laughs> do much better at that than, than Linux can, frankly. So in any case, <clears throat> um, take that number with a grain of salt, obviously, because there's a bunch of things you can do to even out the playing field. But out of the box, um, we, we have seen you know, up to 8% faster for workloads over the bare metal. Okay, so that's CRX, a lot of cool, fun stuff there. Um, and as I said, uh, you know, you, uh, as you're provisioning these, they go to DRS, DRS will do all the intelligent placement, you know, make sure all these things are separated, everyone's got good performance, so on and so forth. And not only that, but you can also run VMs. Those VMs can come from vCenter via the traditional APIs, or they can come from Kubernetes, Kubernetes using the VM service that we just talked about. And these can all coexist in the same physical cluster. So you don't need to have one physical cluster just for Kubernetes and a different one for your VMs. The whole point here is that you can share the underlying physical hardware. You can share this cluster with all types of apps together. And again, they all get the great vSphere capabilities uh, that we've been talking about. So this is called the supervisor cluster. Um, <clears throat> it is really the, the, you know, the, the core physical cluster um, that you know, is, is ESX. So we have both with an ESX cluster and a supervisor cluster, the same physical set of hosts there. Okay, so now that we have the supervisor cluster and all these different uh, services that are exposed, you know, registry, network, storage, et cetera, we, we can build on that with these high-level services, right? So we talked about the TKG service, this notion of actually being able to provision Kubernetes clusters uh, on top of Kubernetes. Now you're like, okay, that's kind of weird. How does that even work? What we're doing is we're using the Kubernetes API to instantiate additional Kubernetes clusters. And so this is kind of this bootstrapping mechanism here. This the supervisor cluster is built in, like when you install vSphere 7 with Project Pacific, it's just there. Um, and then you can use that to provision additional uh, TKG clusters. And each of these TKG clusters is a separate Kubernetes cluster. It runs in a set of VMs, uh, just like today, so no difference there. The reason you wanna do this, rather than just using the supervisor cluster for all your apps, is a few things. Um, number one, you can give your developers or other folks administrative access uh, to that cluster. You can't do that for the supervisor cluster because it's too much, of, too much of a security issue. Uh, you can allow those folks to install CRDs or operators or whatever they want in, in these uh, guest clusters. Uh, you can have them, um, uh, what else? So there's a few other things like you know different security profiles there. Um, and you can use them, you know, you can enable them to have different Kubernetes versions. So, you know, depending on what software you're using may require different Kubernetes versions. Supervisor, of course, will only be one version at a time. So for, for a lot of those reasons, um, we really look at the supervisor as kind of a bootstrapping mechanism, a way to give developers access to a, you know, part of vCenter, allow them to provision uh, these clusters here, and then to actually provision the, their uh, uh, applications on top of that. Um, we talked about the VM and vSphere pod service. You know, we have all that uh, there. And then finally, going forward, what we want to get to eventually is various sorts of partner services as well. We can actually, you know, run MongoDB in this thing or uh, Cassandra or, you know, whatever else. Um, again, because of the fact that it is Kubernetes and a lot of these vendors have Kubernetes operators, uh, operators just a way of integrating their software with Kubernetes. Uh, that integration will work seamlessly. And so we're working with a lot of them to, to validate all that. So, so again, th this notion of leveraging Kubernetes as an infrastructure interface allows us to start building a lot on top of vSphere. And you can see, you know, that the various like Tanzu components also naturally integrate there, integrate there because of the fact that it is Kubernetes as a lingua franca. So you can start to see here how our focus on Kubernetes top to bottom uh, really allows us a lot of improved integration, improved capabilities um, uh, across the board. Okay, <clears throat> so that's our replatform and really how we can help take all of your apps, your entire application fleet forward uh, into the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, so now after that, we'll talk about rehost, but uh, let's see, do we have any questions? Let's pause for questions here real fast. Uh, someone was asking, can we have this slide, or is it only for VMware internal use? No, th this, this, I mean, I'm assuming this, not this slide <laughs> we're talking about here, but uh, this slide maybe. Uh, yeah, this is very much public. I know it says confidential at the bottom, because um, this is a 
Uh, is this actually even, I guess it's not an NDA session, is it? Well, ignore the confidential then. You can you feel free to take a screenshot of this or whatever. I mean, I've used ver ver variants of this slide numerous times at VMworld, uh, many other, like this slide's a little bit more evolved from the ones we used before, uh, but same basic content. So all these slides here are, are public. We've used them in different public forums before. So feel free to use it. I should have removed the confidential apologies about that. All right. Okay, let's keep going. <clears throat> so now we talk about rehost. And again, rehost is about how do you move, you know, from on-prem to the cloud or maybe between clouds or to the edge or, or wherever you want. And for that discussion, it obviously comes back to our software-defined data center, uh, the ability to provide consistent infrastructure, consistent operations across there. And, you know, I think if you look at this, it's been sort of an evolution here, right? Uh, we started off with just vSphere, which is not even really on this picture, kind of evolved to core HCI, which is just vSAN and vSphere, then our full stack uh, HCI, which of course includes NSX, and then finally moving to a actual cloud service uh, for the SCDC. And so again, there's this sort of evolution and it's really kind of, you know, choose your adventure type of thing here. Um, we don't think there's a one size fits all solution. We think that each customer is going to be a little bit different. And not only that, depending on your use case, you know, you may be using different ones of these even within a single customer, right? You may be using something in your data center versus something else at the edge versus something else in the cloud. And so that's really the power of the SCDC is that sort of versatility and that sort of choice uh, that it drives. And so, of course, the SCDC comes together uh, with our VM VMware Cloud Foundation. Uh, it brings together not just core compute storage network, uh, vSphere, NSX, vSAN, but also management with vRealize, and now Kubernetes as well with uh, TKG. And so as we've evolved vSphere, uh, vSphere 7 to include Kubernetes, uh, VCF itself has evolved as well to include uh, TKG. So all of the you know, v VCF 4 additions you know, now have Tanzu built in, Kubernetes built in, to really just drive that, that simplicity and that integration that, that we've been talking about for the past few slides here. Um, <clears throat> but with VCF as a foundation, what we're seeing is that there's a lot of different ways uh, customers want to consume them. I talked about kind of the evolution of it uh, on the, the vertical axis, if you will, before. Now let's look at it more from a horizontal. And for the horizontal, the question here is really, who's operating it? You know, who gets up in the middle of the night if something breaks? The traditional models, of course, is that we sold you, our customers, software, which meant that you know, you're, you're the ones getting up in the middle of the night if something broke, you call us if there was a problem, we'd help you out. But in the end, you, know, you were taking the page. That's what customer managed means. And so, you know, again, we've done a lot there. Uh, we're doing a lot with more you know, HCI type prescriptive architectures, things like VxRail, really just trying to simplify the experience out of the box, drive a lot of automation around that. Uh, so there's just you know less things that you guys have to think about, less things that you guys have to deal with. The other model that we've had for a long time is our partner managed model. And this is where one of our you know, VCPP partners, uh, we've got about um, uh, 4,200 of them, quite a few, <clears throat> that will take our software and deliver it to you, the customer, as a service. And in this case, the partner is the one that takes the page at 2 a.m. if something goes wrong. You know, uh, they have to go fix it. And uh, you know, now we've partnered with all the mega clouds as well, you know, Azure, Google. Azure just announced actually uh, an update to their service where they're no longer using Cloud Simple. They're actually just doing it themselves, uh, which is awesome. And um, you know, partnerships with uh, Google, partnerships with Oracle, Alibaba, IBM, you know, the list goes on and on. So you know, all the major cloud players are now running uh, vSphere and SCDC. And finally, there's the, the newest one, which is the right-hand side, and that's really around VMware managing the offering. And so in that model, uh, you know, it's our engineers who are running this. They're the ones that take the page and wake up at 2 a.m. And we've you know, proliferated this, right? We started out with just VMC on AWS. Uh, we now have VMC on Dell EMC, which is actually an on-prem version of this. So you can actually get a cloud service on-prem, which is super cool. And then VMC on AWS Outposts as well, which is also on-prem. And so, you know, VMC and AWS, I, I'm assuming most people here are familiar with that. I don't think we need to go into that too much. Um, but it is, you know, really VCF running in the AWS data centers on their bare metal. Um, you know, all, all the great capabilities in terms of, you know, compatibility, 
uh, with your on-prem environment, uh, ease of migration back and forth. Uh, obviously seeing a ton of usage here, especially uh, now with everything happening around COVID, uh, people working from home. Uh, we're seeing a lot of use actually with Verizon, our, our desktop solution on top of VMC. Again, a lot of people suddenly, a lot of companies suddenly need to work from home and overnight, you know, how do you spin up all these environments very, very quickly? Well, cloud's perfect for that, right? That's the whole point of cloud is to adjust, you know, on demand to these sorts of things. And so um, we've, we've been working, you know, basically 24 seven, getting all these customers stood up uh, using Horizon and, and VMC and, and just in general, seeing a lot of VMC usage. Uh, across the board. So if you haven't checked it out yet, please do. It's it's really great. It's it's growing now. We've got kind of global coverage, and you know global coverage not just with AWS, but but really with with all the cloud partners, right? And so if you look at you know what what we built here uh, across the board with VMC, with VCPP, with all these things, um, you know what what you start to see is this a very interesting type of concept here. I talked about before about this kind of horizontal model that VMware has and you know this notion of supporting all sorts of stuff underneath us and all sorts of stuff above us and when you start looking at this I mean look at this you know worldwide coverage that we have here and this is by the way not even completely thorough this like we have a lot more dots you know we have 4300 VCPP partners so there's obviously not 4300 dots on here that's like what a hundred or so of them um, so this is a small subset of the overall global footprint that we really have here and you know, what's common across there is vSphere, is the SDDC, is things like HCX, our migration technology. And so what we created here is a massive, massive, massive distributed cloud, right? Um, kind of a meta cloud, if you will, that we're kind of layering on top of all these other clouds to create this level of consistency and uniformity across it. And so that's something like really powerful, something again, very, very unique to VMware. And I think this is what allows us to deliver those sorts of values that we talked about at the very beginning. We have gone and organically created uh, probably the biggest like you know meta cloud or whatever however you want to call it uh, in the world right so it's so very very interesting there and you know as we built that foundation from an infrastructure perspective we can then layer on top of that an operational aspect as well and so you're familiar with vRealize uh, you're probably familiar with a lot of the other things we've introduced we've talked about some of them already Wavefront just talked about Horizon you know, things like HCX uh, for mobility. Um, but really, you know, the idea is as we've standardized on Cloud Foundation, as we proliferated that, like in the previous slide, we can then layer on all those operational capabilities on top of that uh, to really drive greater scale and simplicity and, uh, you know, enabling you to manage workloads anywhere around the world or public cloud, private cloud, edge, what have you. So that's the Rehost story. And again, you know, pretty powerful story there. For replace and retire, um, this one is essentially like rehost until the app can be decommissioned. It's really that simple. For both replace and retire, you're either replacing it with SaaS or you're, um, you may, I don't know, usually replacing it with SaaS. Or for retire, you're just getting rid of it. And so in both cases, that app will be decommissioned. And so rehost allows you to move it around or do whatever you need to do. If you need to evacuate a data center, what have you, um, that, that can, you know, keep that app from limiting your, your other business options while you work on retiring it or, or rehosting it. Okay, so, um, so in summary, we really believe that we are uh, the fastest path to app modernization. And we also believe that app modernization takes many different forms. Um, there is no one size fits all. There is no like true kind of single, you know, Nirvana destination. I think we all this idea that you know that we know what Nirvana looks like today, and we, we want to move a certain set of apps there. It doesn't make sense to move every app there. And so it's all about how do you choose the right technology, the right tool for the right job. And so as you can look across all these different uh, types of jobs that are here, refactor, reflatform, etc., we have the right sets of tooling and capabilities to help you get there. And again, I think because of our horizontal architecture, our ability to support broad diversity below us and above us, we are uniquely positioned uh, to help customers there. And finally, <clears throat> the one thing I'll, I'll end with, and we can take some questions, is, you know, we actually are okay, irrespective of what your future state looks like. That future state can include VMware, that future state may not include VMware. I talk to a lot of customers who say, you know what, uh, I've gone all in with, pick your cloud, Google, right? Gone all in with Google, 
go in there and move all my apps there. So VMware, you're not strategic to us anymore. I'm like, okay, well, how many apps do you have? And you know, we go through the conversation and they have hundreds of apps and they're all in these different states and it's gonna take them like, you know, like years to move them all. I'm like, well, we have the SCDC running in Google. How about you just vMotion them up there, right? And then you can get all your apps there and then you can figure out how you wanna refactor them. Now you're running in Google. Um, and, and that, you know, gets you a lot of benefits, right? You can start using the Google higher level services, all this stuff. And so I think, uh, again, irrespective of whether VMware is part of that future state or not, VMware is critical to getting you to that future state. And I think the other point I, I, I talked to a lot of folks about is that, you know, your future state now probably won't be your future state in three years. Again, you know, even especially with things like COVID, just like the amazing amount of uncertainty and change that, that's out there, you have to have that sort of optionality um, to change direction. Uh, based on the, the environment. And so, again, I think VMware is really, really unique in being able to deliver that optionality. So that's why I believe that VMware is strategic to every customer, irrespective of where, what their future state architecture is. And simultaneously, it's also the fastest path to that app modernization. So that's all the prepared material I have. So now I'm happy to take uh, Q&A. Still not, don't, still don't see any questions. Okay, so Vivek has a few questions here. Um, does, how does Tanzu differ from regular mission control using mutable and validating webhooks to roll down security policies? Um, let's see. Wow, okay, some very specific questions. So does Tanzu, how does Tanzu differ from regular mission control? I guess I'm not even sure. So first things first, Tanzu is not a, a product, it's a, it's a umbrella portfolio. So I'm not sure which product you're actually referring to. You're talking about the vSphere 7 integration, or are you talking about uh, TKG? So if you don't mind providing some more specificity there. Um, let's see, uh, does VMware provide additional features? Like does it have something similar to Helm to prepare Helm charts? So we do support Helm charts. Um, you know, we do have, um, we do have, uh, blanking on the name, our container registry, uh, Harbor. Uh, so we do have things like that. And, um, you know, there, there are capabilities in um, uh, the, the Tanzu application catalog uh, that can support some of those things. So yeah, so we fully integrate uh, with Helm and, and can do that, but there's a variety of other mechanisms there as well for orchestration around um, uh, Kubernetes apps. Will you support Node.js later as a framework for deployment since most apps use it over spring? Um, <clears throat> for deployment, and again, I'm not sure exactly which, you're talking about uh, within spring itself, like spring boot, or to some, some of these I need a bit more context. Uh, hey, Kate, thanks for the presentation. Uh, yeah, it's mainly with spring boot, and uh, I was talking about Tanzu mission control, basically, so, it, I saw it uh, helping you roll down security policies, basically. So I was wondering how uh, is this different from the regular way, you know, like using dynamic inventory and then uh, admission machine control, which basically uses webhooks to figure out uh, whatever incoming requests that come in, right? And then uh, it decides on either, uh, so based on the object of request that's coming in, it checks, it does some mutable part, right? it checks to see what can be done to this, and then uh, the end action is then validated using the validating webhooks, and then mm -hmm. it rolls down whatever actions that it was supposed to do. So uh, it, mission control is like very similar to that. Uh, the regular feature that's done, to, uh, you know, how Kubernetes is deployed. So I was wondering, uh, is there anything additional mission control can do with vSphere, except for the regular, you know, deployment of security policies? Yeah, so um, so you're talking about in the context of vSphere? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, T, so TMC today only manages the TKG uh, clusters on top of vSphere. It does not manage a supervisor cluster. <clears throat> so supervisor cluster is still managed separately. Uh, you manage that through vSphere. And um, yeah, so in vSphere, you're you know, determining various security policies, who has access, et cetera. For the, the TKG created clusters or TMC managed uh, TKG clusters, that's just standard stuff, right? So that's, that's no different than, than you could do today. 
with Tanzu um, or with Kubernetes. Does that make sense? Kind of separating out the guests okay, from the supervisor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, now it makes a lot of sense. Sure, thank yeah, you. So, and the last one is, uh, yeah, sorry. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, yeah, and the last one is uh, uh, AWS has the code commit repo and Azure has their own Azure repos uh, for version and things. So we are introducing something in the future. It's more like having an entire pipeline build being built in, uh, on VMware platforms, very similar to what the other cloud providers have. Yeah, I'm not actually not, uh, not as familiar with code commit. Um, so we, we do have a number of, of things. So let's see. I mean, we have CICD systems like Concourse that comes from Pivotal, right? We have things like CodeStream that orchestrate some of this stuff. Um, but I'm not sure if that is exactly what code commit does or Azure repos. I'm not familiar with either of those two things, unfortunately. So yeah, I, I can't comment on that. I apologize. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, you really answered uh, the Tanzu one. That was really useful. Thank you so much for your presentation as well. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the questions. And uh, you know, I was going to say, I guess to finalize that one, like we, we are looking at eventually maybe having TMC managing the supervisor cluster as well to try and integrate some of that, but that's uh, some time coming there. Okay. So then <clears throat> Thomas is asking, uh, what are your thoughts about future of multi-tenancy for VM and Kubernetes together, VCD, VIO, et cetera? Yeah, so this is a good question. Um, kind of a uh, interesting one that we've been debating as well. So a couple of thoughts on that one. So first of all, the introduction of the supervisor cluster into vSphere does create a lightweight form of multi-tenancy um, within vSphere. And by that, I mean what you now have is uh, so basically the way this works is that that supervisor cluster will be carved up into what are called namespaces and a namespace is just essentially a way i mean uh, if, if you know vSphere they're kind of like a resource pool but they're much more than just a resource pool so they're both carving out resources but you also can give uh users access to that specific namespace and only that namespace and so the idea here is that a user who may not have any access to vSphere or vCenter, I should say, can actually get access to that namespace. And so that's something that's really, really powerful because traditionally um, we have not want, you know, best practices have said, don't give developers direct access to vCenter, right? This is not what you do. And so, um, so now you can actually do that on a namespace basis. So that's powerful because now the developer can get access there. They're still limited in terms of the resources they can use. You can put limits around the namespace just like you can a resource pool. But now the developer can go in there and, and use the Kubernetes API to create workloads, you know, do whatever they want. So there's kind of the self-service capability there. So um, the question is though becomes, uh, how is that, uh, two, two things, how is that orchestrated and how is that operated? So on the orchestration front, um, you know, you do still need something to actually create the namespace for that developer or user. That could be a person, it could be the VI admin who's manually doing it, but ideally you'd, you'd be uh, automating that. So you could use VRA to automate that. Uh, we're, we're looking into integration with, with VCD to automate that. I'm not looking so much at, at Bio um, and OpenStack, <laughs> but we are looking at you know those, those first two ways of, of automation. It's otherwise, I mean, you could potentially use Terraform or you know, whatever you want, but, um, but I guess even Terraform lacks the governance aspect and anyway so you need some way of doing that um and then uh then the operation side of it is you know you're looking at who's getting who has access to vcenter and how are you managing that one right and so again um you know things like vcd are better in, in those sorts of scenarios because uh, they do have you know better multi-tenancy top to bottom uh, but in general, I think what we're seeing here is that we are now introducing a level of multi-tenancy into vSphere that we have not had before. And so there are a lot of debates actually happening right now internally about how we look at that going forward. And um, I think this is in general a good thing and actually strengthens um, you know, the, the VCD story because now we have kind of multiple levels of enforcement of multi-tenancy. Um, but obviously we're not, you know, we haven't fully thought this out yet. So I'm not sure if that's the answer you were looking for. Uh, feel free to respond if you had a different direction you wanted me to take it. 
Uh, but I do think it's a really, really good observation and something that we're you know, actively discussing. Okay, so Thomas is also asking, any plans for integration with Quarkus? I've never even heard of Quarkus, <laughs> or other method for pre-compiling workloads. Um, I actually don't know what Quarkus is. Um, let's, let's, I'll have to look that one up. In terms of pre-compiling workloads, um, I'm not sure where that would fit exactly. I mean, most of the layers of the stack are pretty, um, you know, they, they don't really care, right? Where the, well, what, what type, like, you know, this is containers for a lot of it's just containers, like at vSphere, Kubernetes level, it's just a container. We don't know. Um, well, hold on a second, I'm gonna call. Nope. Um, <clears throat> we don't care what's in the container, we're just gonna run it for you. When you get up to the uh, Tanzu level and you look at like things like Pivotal and, and Spring Boot, there things might get interesting. Uh, so I don't know uh, what their plans are for that one. So I'm sorry, I can't answer that one either. Apologies. <clears throat> Other questions? Did this make sense? Did it not make sense? Yeah, no, this definitely made sense. Appreciate your time, Kit. That was very useful content. Um, so th thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and stop recording here in just a second and leave it open for a, you know, a little bit of people follow up questions. But um, as we mentioned at the beginning, this presentation was recorded. Your TAM can make that available to you. And then please join us again next month when we'll be looking at NSXV to NSXT migrations. We look forward to seeing you then on June the 4th. Thanks. Great. Thanks, everyone.